I'm very happy to see uh, such a big turnout and such a distinguished audience and reactors. We really appreciate your presence, uh, entertaining uh, or accommodating our invitation. So just as a clarification, no, uh, this is really a landmark law. Since that time, if you look at every single General Appropriations Act, no, the national budget of the country, AFMA is always invoked, right? So this is how important that is. Without this AFMA, we, we don't really have a, a budget for agriculture and fisheries modernization. Now, just as a clarification, it's already 2023. And why is it quarter century if the law was passed in 1997? My justification is the law took effect in 1998 when the implementing rules and regulations uh, were, were passed. So uh, the shepherds of this would be uh, include uh, uh, Secretary Angara at the time and uh, uh, Secretary Dar in 1998 uh, as uh, one of the shepherds of this act. So... The question is, we are posing the question, how modern is Philippine agriculture? Because it's an agriculture and fisheries modernization act, right? So 25 years later, has it achieved uh, its objectives? Let's proceed. Next slide. So this book is exactly about that question. Next slide. Now, to evaluate whether the law has achieved its objectives, let's look at the what the law says. <laughs> it's, its own objectives are. Let's go to, uh, I, I believe, this is section three of the law. No, uh, And remember, this is a key law. It's the legal framework for agricultural development in the Philippines. Some people might say, oh, no, it's the charter of the Department of Agriculture in 1986. But I would argue that this is really the landmark law because how it appears over and over in our uh, General Appropriations Act. So there are actually 10 objectives. So generally, modernizing the agriculture and fishery sectors, uh, converting farms from resource-based to technology-based. No, that's the complete statement. Uh, I, I should also apologize that I should actually give all of the chapter authors uh, opportunity to speak. But if I do that in detail, we have a choice of doing a two-day seminar versus a two-hour uh, book launch like today. In as much as the book is available for all to be uh, to to read for free, I think uh, let's all have just uh, our own chance to to uh, really peruse and absorb the contents of the book ourselves. And this is just a short overview. All right. The second uh, objective is to enhance profits and incomes in the agriculture and fisheries sector, and then food security is the third objective. Consolidation, interesting, no? Right now we're hearing a lot about consolidation. It was way back there, 1997, issue of consolidation. Also, uh, empowerment, we've been hearing this for a long time. This was enshrined in the AFMA. Market-driven approach, very controversial these days. But yes, it is a matter of law in the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act. Number seven, uh, value-added uh, ladder. This is very prescient for its time. Uh, right now, we're hearing a lot about uh, um, uh, industrialization and modern value chains in agriculture. Then rural industry, again, another prescient uh, aspect of the law. They, they would like to see rural areas industrialize. And then um, the environment. Uh, this has always been a longstanding issue. But right now, uh, the law actually... Uh, um, made this an objective. And lastly, quality of life, which is kind of a cross-cutting generic uh, objective. Next slide, please. So question for the book is, were these objectives achieved? If not, okay, so what are the prospects for meeting these objectives? So to understand, to analyze that question or to answer that question, we need to know what needs to be done so that those prospects can materialize. Because if the prospects are favorable, usually it's, it, it carries an if, right? If this, 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 then it's favorable. But if these don't materialize, then probably it's not going to happen. So next slide. All right. Now, this is not by any means the first review 
Uh, the book actually mentions several past reviews of the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act. And actually, it's not like we disregarded them. We quoted them in extensively uh, in, in this book. We made sure that you know we don't re re reinvent the wheel, but rather we cite them. And if there are uh, any more gaps in our understanding of you know the the the, the research question, uh, we we address them in this book. No, so uh, we focus on outcomes and impacts rather than inputs and strategies. So the previous books, if you look at the structure of the AFMA, it's heavy on the various chapters. So there's a chapter on uh, 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 spatial spatial aspect, no, the the SAFDZ, SAFDZ, no, uh, the there's an uh, infrastructure and then another chapter on credit and so on. So these are the various inputs and strategies mandated by the law. And if you look at those previous reviews, I'm not I'm not saying that they're bad; they're very good. But from the perspective of those, no. Here, our perspective is strongly emphasizing the outcomes. It's a more of a results-based uh, approach to uh, examining or assessing the law. So that's why the core question is how modern. So if the objective was modernizing, so the question now is modern na ba? Okay, so that's how we approach it. And if you look at those objectives, were each of those objectives achieved? And that is the substance of each chapter. Now, the first chapter is just an overview. The second chapter looks at market-based approach. That was one of the objectives of the law. And now we're going to ask, uh, what is market-based approach actually uh, followed in, in the subsequent quarter century upon effectivity of the app? The, thir uh, the third is technology, especially at the farm level. Why does agricultural production level remain low despite increased investments in research and extension? So, oh, by the way, the chapter one and two, the author is myself, so I don't need to mention, but the third chapter is now uh, Dr. Rowena Bakongis, the uh, currently dean in uh, um, College of Public Affairs in University of the Philippines, Los Baños. So she was, uh, uh, she, she welcomed our invitation to join, uh, one of our key experts, next slide. Uh, Dr. Sonko, uh, uh, Mr. Sonko, Danilo Sonko, of, uh, a professor of uh, um, AIM, uh, welcomed our invitation to write the chapter on people empowerment. Uh, so this is related to social enterprises. So one of the objectives of the law is not just, you know, uh, just any way, let's just modernize agriculture and fisheries. No, we want to achieve it through empowerment of farmers and fisher folk. So he wrote that chapter. The next chapter is consolidation. Again, that's one of the objectives of the law. We want to achieve, uh, well, actually it's mentioned in the law, no? economies of scale to be achieved through consolidation and integration. So Arlene, uh, former dean and right now professor of De La Salle University, together with co-authors uh, wrote this chapter. Next. Uh, the next is uh, whether agriculture and fisheries ascend the value added ladder. That's one of the objectives of the law written by, uh, can I say it now, uh, uh, Carlo, Assistant Secretary? Oh, <laughs> am, am I jumping the gun? Yeah. Uh, just chime in, no? Uh, <laughs> uh, DOF Assistant Secretary. And uh, this is, a, shall I say, a mother and son team, no? Both economists. Sorry, uh, Professor Adriano, if if I if I uh, mentioned that you were my professor in Upilus Banos, uh, I, I I have to say it. <laughs> so I I learned everything uh, about uh, <laughs> agricultural development from her knee. Uh, just kidding, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, she was a, a big contributor. The next chapter relates to structural transformation in the context of te technological change, as it deals with the issue of rural industries which is uh, another objective of the law. So the law is not just about agriculture and fisheries, but the related rural area development, including the formation of rural industries. So that chapter is about that. Next. The last set of chapters relates to the final impact. No, So a lot of these is somewhat related to the means. So we need to modernize value chains, uh, uh, you know, uh, invigorate people's organizations and empowerment and what and, and etc. 
But here, what do we, why do we want to invigorate value chains and people? Sorry. Well, we want to achieve higher profits and incomes in agriculture and fisheries. So I wrote that chapter. We want to achieve food security. So this is uh, uh, the, the exact statement in the law is uh, accessible, affordable, and stable food supply. That's authored by Ivory uh, Galang, uh, a, a supervising research specialist uh, in the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. And uh, environment also, how well as environmental protection. So just because you're modernizing doesn't mean that, uh, okay, let's just uh, elevate the yield and expand our uh, hog resources and fisheries resources and uh, uh, to heck with the environment. No, the, the, the law says don't, don't do that. No, <laughs> in, in all respects, keep the environment well protected and all of your production sustainable into the far future. And that's the 10th chapter. So after all of these, we have an 11th chapter synthesis. So this synthesis is actually what I'm going to present in summary form today. And of course, the, the author of chapter 10 is uh, uh, ADB consultant. And uh, if I may mention Maricor, my, my classmate in the UP School of Economics, uh, Maricor Ibarbia. Okay, so next. Right, so all of these, uh, how will AFMA in the law said they will bring it about? So they, 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 at that time, hindi pa uso yung the, the, the term theory of change. But reading the law, parsing, perusing its context, uh, contents, I think we can infer a kind of a theory of change. No, So the AFMA strategies are driven by a market approach towards overcoming a set of macro, meso, and uh, sorry, micro, sorry, that, that's a misprint. Micro, meso, and macro constraints. Micro constraints are there at the farm level. So farms are now what the law says, resource-based, no? So uh, especially if you're a rain-fed farm, no, that's more resource-based or very dependent on the weather, uh, on, on the available soil resources. But the contrast is you apply technology so that you're not that dependent on what Mother Nature provides. Now, when the farms or the operators of the farms, farmers and fishers, no, get together, that's what we call the meso level, so community level. So small farmers and fisher folks are supposed to be empowered by the formation of people's organization and realize economies of scale through collective action. So that's what I call meso level. That's also an objective of the law. And finally, the macro level, which is an economy-wide level, the entire value chain and set of industries is supposed to be also modernized altogether. So we don't imagine, say, fisheries just modernizing by itself. We also need to modernize uh, the canning part, the distribution part, likewise for rice, not just the uh, actual rice production, but also the mailing part, the packaging, and then the, the, the delivery to consumers, no? So all of this entails lifting up the whole agriculture and fisheries value-added ladder, uh, ladder and spreading industries to rural areas with the idea of being that a lot of these industries will not be concentrated in cities, but because they're so closely linked to agriculture, they're going to be actually located in rural areas. The law already... 1998 envisioned this. So don't think that this is something new. 25 years ago, this was already the vision. Once all of these constraints at the micro, macro, and meso, uh, sorry, micro, meso, and macro level are overcome, hopefully this will lead to the intended impacts of the law, which is complete modernization, meaning higher income of small farmers and fisher folks. So no matter what technologies you adopt, et cetera, et cetera, unless the farmer and fisher folk income actually increase, I don't think you can claim that agriculture and fisheries has modernized, no, and no matter how, how tech you claim, how high tech you claim it's, it will be. Likewise, modernization requires that food security, you know, food supplies are affordable, accessible, adequate, and stable. And lastly, no matter what you claim, how, how much you boast about how advanced your agriculture and fisheries are, if your uh, environment is devastated, your coral reefs destroyed, your waterways polluted and, and stinking, you know, pollute. so actually we have uh, right now an issue, right, of the uh, 
oil spillage, maybe unrelated to uh, the action of agriculture, but impacting definitely on the fisheries and other sectors of that area. So uh, all of these are the, uh, the watch no, of the law. Next. Okay, now, so I've just posed the questions. <laughs> How, what did the chapter authors find? No, next. Okay, market approach. So actually, um, to be uh, honest, perfectly honest, yes, actually agricultural policy in terms of adopting the market approach has made considerable progress since at least the mid 1990s, exactly coinciding with adoption of the AFMA and other key legislations such as the agriculture and fisheries tarification, uh, sorry, the agriculture, agricultural tarification act, which is part of our accession to the WTO agreement, no, uh, in 1995, no. Now, still state intervention remains pervasive. So it's not like once you pass those laws, you're done and you can say, okay, market-based approach now. There's still a lot of homework to be done because state intervention and not a sole market approach remains per pervasive with strong reliance on propping up market price through policy induced import barriers. So that's one key finding of that chap chapter. Now, producer support is uh, quite uh, um, a lot of our spending on agriculture is devoted to this producer support. And it's based on commodities, no? Right. Rice is the main example, followed by other banner programs such as corn. Um, and the, the, the chapter finds that the structure of this producer support is skewed towards input subsidies, seed subsidies, machinery subsidies, irrigation is a very large, you know, and we actually, that's a topic of an entire book actually, uh, previously of PIDS. Uh, and then, of course, among the commodities, rice. My my own count is uh, 55 billion uh, total rice budget for 2023, uh, including the National Rice Program, Irrigation, NFA, Fill Rice, uh, and others. Um, that's 1% uh, of, of, um, of the total budget of about 5.5 5, 5 trillion for the country just for one commodity rice. Next. So, okay. So do I complain about subsidies? Uh, actually, yes. And later I'll show you an alternative to those subsidy-based, no? Fertilizers, seeds, and other inputs and machinery. Uh, next is farm level, overcoming the micro constraints. So again, related to the farm. Uh, the chapter showed that actually it's not like there's nothing. There's some productivity growth, some growth in yields, especially for rice and corn. Uh, however, uh, if you benchmark it against other countries, we're not doing very well. So if just ourselves versus last year and the previous years, yes, we're advancing. But against other countries, how fast they're growing, no, we're falling way behind. And in fact, even... Our in, so that's that's the outcome, no? they say the productivity, even our inputs. So maybe we can say, well, one reason why we have fallen behind is not is that our inputs to productivity growth have also fallen behind as the rest of Southeast Asia. For instance, the share of public R&D expenditure, according to this chapter in Philippines, is one of the lowest in Southeast Asia. And therefore, that could be directly implicated towards laggard productivity growth. Uh, smallholders are still far from adopting the latest technologies. And not only that, not only do we fail to budget enough, whatever we budget tends to be wasted because of the fragmented governance of our R&D system combined with our extension. So there is actually an active private sector extension for some commodity inputs, and that's actually the saving grace for, say, livestock. But in others that are more dependent on public sector, research, development, and extension, that's where we have been lagging very, very far behind because of the consistent fragmentation. Next. So next level of constraint is the meso constraint. Now, government, according to the chapter on this, no, uh, the two chapters, Government has been implementing programs to pursue empowerment provisions in the AFMA. So we can see in the various 
regional development councils, municipal development councils, very various other outlets. Farmer representation is being elevated. And actually, when we look at the budgetary outlays, it's possible that these outlays have been rising because precisely because of that farmer representation. But unfortunately, such interventions remain limited in scope and do not actually reach a large majority of farmers and fisher folk. Community organizing is uh, has tried to reach all, but uh, latest estimate is probably 18 to 20 percent of our farmers and fisher folk are a member of some kind of economic enterprise or cooperative or related association. That leaves 80 plus percent unorganized dealing with the government individually. So um, if, if at all, no? So uh, non-government organizations have made it their, their kind of platform to, to, to establish these community organizations. Government said through this AFMA law precisely that they should promote this, but the evaluation of the chapter showed that government is a poor provider of community organi organizations, especially if you benchmark against the performance of non-government organizations. Moreover, even if you look at farmer representation, it's still evaluated as kind of token because still when it come, push comes to shove, who gets to decide where the bulk of the budget goes, it's not the farmers who have to say, but the government officials. So, so you could argue that, well, that's our electoral system. But, you know, uh, the same electoral system crafted this law. So maybe we should try to reconcile the issues. Next. All right. Uh, furthermore, on the meso constraints, uh, farmer and fishery production, still mostly informal. This exists side by side with, a uh, with a, about 10% of the output is produced by a formal sector. So formally registered uh, farms, uh, the business. Now, Related to this, uh, the, the study by Dr. Innocencio looked at the, this formal sector and showed that within this formal sector, there was a high degree of horizontal integration, but low degree of vertical integration. So the objective of integration, the AFMA, seems not to have been achieved, except few sectors like poultry. Poultry is now relatively across all sectors, the more highly vertically integrated. No? So the same company uh, tends to be doing uh, from, from feed production to broiler production to slot to dressing and uh, sale to, to uh, consumers or other end users. So similarly, uh, crops tend to be actually reversed, decreasing trend in terms of concentration, uh, mixed for livestock and poultry and increasing trend at least for fisheries. And for vertical integration, almost all in poultry and livestock, the trend is increasing but not that well integrated, say compared to uh, poultry. Now, uh, do we say that we have achieved economies of scale? Actually, we admit that the evidence is lacking and this is sub so it's not like this book answers all your questions. Actually, this book raises more questions than gives answers. No, So we want more study on whether economies of scale have actually been successfully achieved by all of these uh, integration and consolidation trends that have been reviewed in this chapter. Next. All right, so macro level constraints at the industry level. So maybe to understand this better, we, we look at a typology of value chains starting from traditional to transitioning to modern value chains. So maybe modern value chains think of, uh, I don't know, of fructose corn syrup value chain in the United States. That's an example of a modern value chain, no? Uh, how do we assess some of the major value chains in the Philippines? We are not able to assess all of them because there's so many uh, commodities in Philippines. We looked at some of the major ones in the, in the relevant chapter by Adriano et al. And we looked at the corn value chain, which is transitioning. Likewise, milk fish. Tuna is a mix of transitioning and modern and rice still conditioning. Why do we say that the corn value chain is mostly transitioning? Well, it, this corn value chain actually encompasses not just corn, but also the subsequent feed using industries, uh, livestock, uh, swine, no, uh, cattle, and poultry, no, mostly chicken and uh, duck and some others. 
It remains weakly integrated with our local corn industry. We still import a lot. And the reason why we import a lot is, uh, is because our local corn is simply too expensive. No, So uh, even though uh, the, the sector is highly private sector driven and moving into large scale production and integrated setup, uh, I already mentioned this is common in chicken. This is still... Um, not the case for the other industries such as swine, which is still large state. Uh, there's a significant commercial operation there, but the majority is still a backyard operation. Milkfish is still dominated by small to medium fisher folk. And I'm not saying that this is not a way to do modern. If they can adopt the most modern technologies, that would be great. But in fact, uh, it is the larger scale, which is not so common. That is the one adopting the latest uh, modern practices. Tuna is a mix of transitioning and modern value chain. So there is this kind of a dual structure of uh, catching tuna, not in the Philippines anymore, I understand. And then actually, you know, canning it, uh, uh, even in the ship, the initial operations of canning in the ship, then landing it. But there's still a very wide preponderance of uh, local tuna uh, capture fisheries to feed our local markets. No? So you mga tulingan and so on, they're still very abundant. Rice is still mostly transitioning, still dominated by small-scale farmers. There are some modern rice mills, especially in Luzon, uh, that are ad adopting the most uh, modern practices in very large scale, achieving high milling ratios. But this is not, shall we say, uh, dominant throughout, throughout our rice economy in the country. Now, on the area of rural industry, uh, compared, if you bench, so the chapter went through indicators uh, on rural industry by Dr. Lansona and found that we are still lagging in terms of rural industry dispersal compared with, again, our ASEAN neighbors. Next. Moving on to impacts. Notice that I'm mentioning so much our ASEAN neighbors because how do we, so we can, we can measure progress, right? We, we move from A to B. How do we know that A to B is enough to modernize? Well, what if our neighbors have moved from A to C, right? So we can benchmark maybe A to B is short compared to A to C. That's why we mention a lot, benchmarking against our neighbors. So if you look at the goals of AFMA, no, there has been considerable uh, improvements. We, we cannot deny if you look at uh, various household surveys, even surveys of the PSA, increased income of uh, agricultural households and reduced poverty among them, at least up to the 2018, the, the period that was last reviewed. Nevertheless, poverty remains relatively high. No? If I recall, if it's 18% for the country, it's about 26 plus percent no? for uh, agriculture and fisheries. No? And in fact, this is probably higher after the uh, pandemic. So, so that's income. We've moved far so it's it's not like we're stuck in 1997 the same income of farmers no their income has gone up but not as much no the progress is not as fast as the non-agricultural sectors of the economies so it's kind of unfair the poorest sector is not the sector that has advanced most quickly next is food security the chapter by uh uh, Ms. Galang showed that availability is generally achieved across various food commodities. Hunger incidence has fallen. And the, the share of food secure households based on data from FNRI has been increasing. But what are the remaining problems? There are many. Food or diet quality. So the quantity is okay. The quality is very short. No? Why is the quantity very short? One reason is a lot of the nutritious foods are not affordable. So that is why com combining this with other you know, health-related practices, Philippines is lagging behind the rest of Southeast Asia in eradicating malnutrition. Lastly, looking at environment. So all of these chapters we've been citing, progress here, not as much as the neighbors, etc. But here, Correct me, Marie, if I'm wrong, but from 1998, we're actually arguably worse today than we were. Our environment in agriculture and fisheries is arguably healthier in 1998 than today. Lots of deterioration has happened. No? Coral reefs, soil resources, uplands, 
of the chapter went through all of these systems and found that there are many issues. We're, we've like been fighting a, a losing battle uh, on all of these grounds. So how do we how do we reverse all of this? This is the subject of the next slides. Next. Okay, recommendations. Next. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Okay. So we still have elements of traditional industrial policy, uh, inconsistent with the market approach. We would like to, you know, prop up local prices, uh, help farmers, disadvantage consumers. Uh, maybe another alternative approach is continue to support farmers, but a different way through expenditure programs na hindi naman based on distortionary subsidies. Instead, we now have a National Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization and Industrialization Plan that's already enshrined even in the Philippine Development Plan 2023-2028. Let's move modernization efforts and spend the budget for this. No, So rather than spending so much money for subsidies, why don't we fund a modern industrial policy for the agri-food system? A lot of this is based on private public sector partnerships. And the private sector will come in only if the public sector will also anti up, no? Tataya din siya. Pero the, the private public sector often says, oh, we don't have money for that. So uh, why don't you invest 100%? And the, the, the private sector says, well, uh, if you're asking 100%, we'd rather invest somewhere else, not in agriculture or fisheries because blah, blah, blah. So how do we move the needle towards uh, those modernizing of agriculture and fisheries? We need money for that. Maybe that's a more um, salient uh, 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 element for expenditure rather than the usual, no, let's, let's buy, let's procure fertilizer or that's uh, cheap and then give it away for free for farmers. Then there's a lot of corruption involved. Let's, let's, can we, can, can we stop doing that? <laughs> Next. So uh, reforming, so we've been thinking, okay, maybe we can ref, uh, put more money in R&D extension. Yes, that's part of it. But let's look also at the governance structure, okay? Uh, we need to fix that properly. The extension system, so that's al already a very long story. We've devolved since 1991, but there are many reforms that we need to be able to make it more coherent and more connected to our R&D system. Moreover, I would argue that instead of banner programs based on commodities, we should adopt more area-based bottom-up planning. And if you look at the AFMA itself, that's actually what it provided. There are no banner programs provided in AFMA. There's no national rice program provided there. What it provides is strategic agriculture and fisheries development zones. So why don't we took that, take that seriously? No? Area by area, what are the actual needs of the area? And define the commodity requirements of each area rather than you know, from the top, oh, rice should have so many billions. Let's, again, let's stop. <laughs> let's stop doing that and pay more attention to what the actual areas of the country need, no? uh, including all the way, not just at the, at the level of farm production, but all the way with the, the markets, the agribusiness. Um, now, one, if you talk to interact with agribusiness, one key factor they're always citing is, look, we don't want, it's, it's difficult for us to have a business model where we interact with farmers with 0 0.5, 0 0.7 hectares. It's, it, it, it doesn't make sense, okay? So can we deal with consolidated land holdings and operations? So one way to do this is to, you know, just remove the statutory limits on the ceiling. So five hectares, that's one. Another is, there's another set of reforms. Actually, the current administration is pushing through with these reforms and hopefully uh, they will be implemented, such as the removal of the... Um, the condonation of remaining uh, uh, amortization of uh, uh, lands covered by um, uh, land uh, agrarian reform, the CARP, and then hopefully liberalizing after the condonation, liberalizing the, the free transaction of these land holdings so that, uh, let's say, farmers who are no longer in the circumstance favorable for farming, like they're very old, they're already 70, they have the option of finally 
converting that land to, to monetary asset and transferring it to another farmer, probably a young dynamic farmer who can be more productive with it. So our law should enable such transactions rather than stopping them. Next. Um, more on uh, overcoming macro constraints. So we have right now a set of roadmaps. Can we update and implement seriously these roadmaps rather than just have them documents? One signal that they're really uh, being implemented is when the stakeholders buy in and say, yes, they're actually doing it. But if the stakeholders say, oh, we wasted a lot of time doing these roadmaps, and then it turns out government was not serious with them. That's so sad to hear, right? So let's reinvigorate this process and get all the private sector and farmers on board. And finally, a part of these value chains should have a strong spatial component, you know? so across regions, provinces, even municipalities, if possible, if we have a regional version of these roadmaps, then we could see how rural industries could possibly disperse. And this is how we can reinvigorate our rural industry dispersal policy. Next. Okay, so all of these are towards achieving the ACMA intended impact. So this is kind of like a, um, more reinforcement. Can we evaluate the panel of uh, small farmers and fisher folks today? So maybe this is a prescription for PSA. It's kind of unfair, no? If uh, because of structural change, which I should have mentioned was acknowledged in the AFMA, uh, many of our farmers and fisher folk are actually leaving uh, that profession and, and moving to, say, uh, industry, construction, and services because the remaining farmers and fisher folk are able to make do because they are mechanized production and technology. So this transition is happening, but that means uh, it's it's kind of biased, no, the, the, the households. So if we just have a fixed panel uh, in the beginning, say, in, say, if you start today, then track them up to 2030, then we can really see whether uh, that that those households through various economic processes, including modernization and transition to other industries are actually incre uh, experiencing increased incomes. So that's one. So policies and programs that address the country's food security needs need to be harmonized. The PDP actually sketches, the current version of the PDP, I've read it, and it sketches one way to be able to achieve that harmonization. For example, more coherent trade policies where you adhere to basis of the law rather than political politicized uh, implementation no so uh and the various other aspects of food security maintaining buffer stocks and so on if you could just harmonize those policies and programs that will be uh moving us in the direction of better food security and finally being more serious about ecosystem approaches so we we mentioned ecosystem approaches that uh, you know Let's not just think of reclaiming this coastal zone because that will open up more commercial areas and development, develop the city. But forgetting that, oh, what about the rest of the values produced by that ruined rec uh, coastal area because of your reclamation project? So uh, a more ecosystem-based approach would call possibly uh, force us to reevaluate a lot of the developmental uh, projects that we're undertaking now, no? So I'm not saying that we should stop all development. I'm saying that uh, a judicious examination based on all of the relevant uh, uh, values, including environmental values, uh, which is part of that ecosystem approach, would do a lot to make sure that you know when we when we uh, advance the development of our swine production, our poultry production, our rice production, we don't do uh, un. un um, unintended harm to greenhouse in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, water pollution, and, and the rest of it, no? So all of this, how do we tie them together? Interestingly, the AFMA itself provides for a program benefit monitoring and evaluation system, PBMES. So whether we call it that or some other, some kind of results-based management approach. Now, this approach is starting was starting to be implemented in the 2010s by Philippine government. But uh, we, we still largely do a knee-jerk type of uh, programming and policy in my assessment. No? The closer we can shift our 
policy and programming towards a more results-based approach, meaning, is it working? Is this subsidy program really achieving its objectives or maybe we're just wasting our money and then maybe we can think of something else? If we start introducing that thinking and the system to check you know, whether it's really working because we have that monitoring system, that will be a dramatic uh, change in the way we do business in, uh, in developing the agriculture and fisheries sector. Next. All right, so sorry for that kind of extended summary. I hope that uh, by reading the book, you can flesh out all of the details of the kind of throwaway statements I made, no? Because I guarantee that a lot of these uh, were well argued and we have numbers and indicators to back up this results-based uh, assessment of uh, modernization of Philippine agriculture and fisheries. Thank you.